As the year unwound, sounds abound, and some of them are bloody great. Others not so much, some acts out of touch, in the wondrous year of 1968. Where were you on the 8th of March 1968? I was here, right here. Number six this week was what? I'm just trying to mix things up. Okay, all right. Number 10 this week is Love is Blue by Paul Moriart and his orchestra. One of the biggest hits of the year, and I don't think I'm cutting anyone's lunch to say this was on its way to number one on the 22nd of March. An easy listening standard, Jeff Beck quickly rockified it using the same lineup as on his Truth album with some production embellishments from Mickey Most. That's the one that should have been the hit. At nine, it's the already hopelessly out of date Gary Puckett and the Union Gap who flounced about in their Civil War get-up at a time when uniform-wearing bands, unless it was Sergeant Pepper Band's uniforms, and war in general were like Squaresville Man. But it must be said that GP and the UG had a respectable five top 20s in Australia and one near miss in 18 months, and Puckett will forever be remembered as the second most famous musician ever to hail from Hibbing, Minnesota. Number 8. Georgie Fame oozes R&B cool with the ballad of Bonnie and Clyde. Georgie, whose mum, Mrs Powell, calls him Clive, had three top ten hits and made number one with all of them. Fame, who was forced to use the stage name by manager Larry Parnes, who insisted on name changes for all his charges, Billy Fury, Martin Weil, Vince Power, Barry Colossus, etc., became the go-to backing musician for a huge array of touring acts. In the 1990s, he made a bit of a comeback as Van Morrison's musical foil and arranger, adding his unmistakable organ tone to several Morrison albums, both as a band leader and as guest. In at seven, it's Bubblegumster's extraordinaire Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart. They went solo when, after writing and producing the theme song for the Monkees and the mega hit Last Train to Clarksville, they were mysteriously fired by the Monkees' Svengali, Don Kirshner. With a resounding, screw you Don, they proceeded to write three top 30 hits for themselves and place a couple of other songs with other artists. But the magic it would seem was gone. But I Wonder What She's Doing Tonight would undoubtedly have been a number one had it been given to the monkeys. And if you close your eyes when you listen to it, it's hard to tell between the two acts. When the songs came in for the monkeys, they were all pre-recorded by Boyce and Hart's backing band, the Candy Store Prophets, and Boyce and Hart actually did the vocal parts for them. The duo drifted apart in the 1980s, especially after a disastrous gig in Middlesbrough, England in 1979 where Boyce's solo band sold exactly one ticket. Hart lives to this day, having earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Song, but Boyce died in pitiable circumstances in Nashville in 1994. The Hump is in the house. Engelbert Humperdinck, King of Granny Rock, had the biggest selling single of 1967. Could he match that in 1968? The man who kept Penny Lane off number one in the UK. The man who once said he could hit notes that a bank couldn't cash, began to experience somewhat diminished returns on his singles in 68. Perhaps as the bright lights of Las Vegas with its give the people what they know mentality obviated the need for new hit singles. But the hits did keep on coming through 1968, good and plenty, but a top out at number five for this most widely travelled of country standards seems a little disappointing. We poke a lot of fun at the hump here, but it must be said that this guy's life and career are a story that make your typical rock star's life look positively banal. It fully deserves an episode in itself. It will blow your mind. Number 5, Bottle of Wine by the Fireballs. A record that sounds like it was recorded in 1964 that somehow got released in 1967, it still lingered for six weeks in the top ten, perhaps because of the large number of record-buying alcoholics in town. Mundane as the record might be, the band has an interesting history going back to 1963 when they were known as Jimmy Gilmer and the Fireballs and they released a song called Sugar Shack, which was, along with Surfing USA by the Beach Boys, Billboard's number one single of 1963. 
It also literally broke the top 40. The problem was, as well as making number one on the Billboard Pop chart, it also made number one on the R&B charts, despite not being played on a single black format radio station. These radio stations then complained vociferously to Billboard that so many honkies were having R&B hits, the R&B songs weren't crossing back, that the two charts were now pretty much indistinguishable from one another. It's time to say a hearty hello to the newcomers to the top 10 this week and pause a moment to remember those brave soldiers of songcraft who fell by the wayside. In this week is Love Is Blue, previously mentioned bound to be the next number one record. It's a record I very much remember on the radio, particularly at my grandparents' place. They listened to Radio National and I suspect it was used as buffer music between live programs. The record that knocked Love Is Blue off the top spot is at number 19, and the record that would presage a couple of hard rock number ones and then nothing but easy listening bubblegum or light pop until Hey Jude took over in late September. I wonder what she's doing tonight, spent the first of its two weeks in the 10, both of them at number 7, and Am I That Easy To Forget spent five weeks in the 10, where after it was easily forgotten. Heading down to the lower reaches of the charts for a farewell tour and Nancy Sinatra's number six gracing You Only Live Twice. Different drum, allegedly by the Stone Ponies, but anyone can really only ever name one of them, and that's Linda Ronstadt. Ronstadt's career has been amazing again, absolutely worthy of its own story, as much for her integrity as a person and as an artist, rising above the cesspool of scumbags who sought to exploit her at every turn. Accompanying them in the Death Spiral Farewell Tour is at that point the biggest selling Australian 45 of all time, John Farnham's Sadie, which just spent six weeks at number one, tumbling down from number four. His next single, The Sentimental Only Underneath the Arches, was to be surpassed in every way by its excellent B-side, Friday Kinda Monday, the kind of record that John Farnham absolutely beats the world in making. Number four is the wonderful Tin Soldier by The Small Faces. Like most of the top ten this week, this had a fairly brief stay there, only six weeks for a top of three, but unlike a lot of the ten, it deserved longer. There's always the slightly sad thought hovering over the band that they never really reached their potential apart from a handful of excellent early singles. They remain nothing more than talented mimics, always on the cusp of what was fashionable, usually a day late if not a dollar short. Of course, the band had just returned from a tour of Australia where the Who, they came in high summer, roasting heat, and had to travel incredible distances in that heat. The first thing they did when arriving was have Ian McLaughlin tell local journalists to f*** The Who soon got up to the usual brand of hotel room mayhem, especially in New Zealand, and it took little to encourage the small faces to join them. So bad was the tour Townsend vowed never to come back to Australia and he held that promise for 37 years. We must have been more to his liking that time because he also came back again in 2008. In New Zealand they were a judge with, we really don't want them back again. They're just unwashed, foul-smelling, boo-swilling no-hopers, which is usually the description New Zealanders reserve for Australians. As for these small faces, they didn't last out 1968, with Steve Marriott storming off stage on New Year's Eve declaring, I quit. Fame in varying form and degrees followed for each member, but drummer Kenny Jones is the only one still alive today. Number 3. Judy in Disguise with Glasses is a 1965 sounding song which somehow found itself at number 1 in February 1968. Some sort of a harbinger of bubblegum. This song is a bit of a hodgepodge of styles. Wilson Pickety horns, a yardbirdish breakdown and a Motown bass. It's a bit rubbish, but again, folks liked it enough to send it to number one. And it's not the only rubbish that would ever be sent to number one. And at two this week, it's the Trogs, Love Is All Around, a gooey love song totally at odds with the band's rough and ready image, which is good. 
This one spent two weeks at number two, but was only ever listed as making number 37 on the new National Go Set chart. That's whack. Some many years later, Scottish contenders Wet 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 had a stonking 15 weeks at number one hit with it when it was used in one of those insufferable Richard Curtis films and became apparently the biggest selling love ballad in British history. Phil Collins was apparently apoplectic, but Trog's leader Reg Presley said thank you very much and enjoyed a comfortable semi-retirement researching crop circles and UFOs on the royalties. R.E.M. also covered it, but did so just at the time when they were beginning to be seen as a bit of a joke. It's time for the fast, the furious and the factual with Fowl's fantastic world of facts. Biggest rise of this week is Manfred Mann with the wonderful Mighty Quinn, a song that author Bob Dylan has only played six times ever in concert, the last time 20 years ago. By way of reference, he's played the roughly contemporaneous All Along the Watchtower 2,268 times, although not in the last five years. Manfred took old Quinny up to number 11 from 19 and on to three weeks at number 4 before it wilted, spending just one more week in the top 10 and finishing up an 11 week chart run in the first week of May. During the spell at 4, his erstwhile bass player did get to number 1 for a couple of weeks, but more on that later. The biggest droopy dropper of the week was Eric Burden and all the animals Monterey, which nosedived to number 38 from 29 in what would be the last of its nine weeks on the chart. Highest deb this week amongst a whopping six of them was Eric Burden and all the animals with Sky Pilot, which came in at an impressive 19. It entered the top 10 the next week and hit the top just in time to be my birthday number one birthday or not, it's still a pretty boring song. And the longest persisting number on the charts this week is You've Not Changed by the only woman who ever won Morrissey's heart, Sandy Shaw, one of the three songs still on the charts from when we visited 1968 in instalment number one. The others are Hello Goodbye by the Beatles in at number 30 and Daydream Believer by the Monkees still strutting at 22. In the US, Love is Blue by Paul Mariette imposed itself at the top of the charts, while in the UK, the indescribably stupid Cinderella Rockefeller unaccountably found itself at number one. Now, one of the small faces in the Who went to Australia. Anything had to be better than listening to this shit. One mere and humble year ago, Snoopy vs. the Red Baron was number one, whereas a year in the future, it was Oobla Dee Oobla Da by the very Beatles themselves. When my oldest was born, I conducted a little thought experiment. If I had to put the White Album on continuous loop from the time the ambulance arrived to the time the little guy was born, what song would be playing as he emerged? As it happens, it would have been Sexy Sadie. Did the same for Hair Levi, Rocky Raccoon. Ivy, who virtually jumped out, was Oobla Dee Oobla Da. So widely disliked as it may be amongst Beatles aficionados, I have a little personal connection with it. Number one album in town this week was their Satanic Majesty's Request by the Rolling Stones, and I think unfairly neglected entry in the Stones canon where it sat for three weeks, having ended Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band's 30-week unbroken stint on the top, whereupon it itself was done for by John Wesley Harding. He's the monkey who's hungry, that dusty funky hunk from the country of Burundi. Warms his sticks for rhythmic tricks and paradiddles on the griddle we call down Monty to lay down some super bad rhythms to play us in. Number one this week is the monkeys with the second of their number ones, the She EP from which the song played all over the radio was the Neil Diamond pen Look Out Here Comes Tomorrow. And if you've got a Neil Diamond song, why wouldn't you play it? A cogent argument of polyamory if ever there was one. Three weeks at number one, it only made number six nationally. It was hustled off the top on March 22 by Love Is Blue. 
In these parts, the Monkees had 12 top 20s with 1969s, good clean fun making number 13 and making us the last place in the world to chart a top 40 single for the Monkees. And there we have it folks, 2,300 words, wow! I do hope you are adequately entertained despite my circumlocutiousness, and I hope to see you again, if the good lords will and the creeks don't rise, in our next instalment in a week. Kish. Good evening, my wonderful friends. Well, it's, it's evening here. Just a quick message to let you know that um, there won't be the usual flow of content coming from this channel for the next foreseeable future um, for those who care those who don't care you can turn off now and go and watch physical format rock and roll or medium quality or crushed custard one of those good channels for those of you who, who do care though i had my surgical review on friday they'll let me know on wednesday and no matter what the outcome of that, um, my priorities will change significantly at that point. I've still got plenty stockpiled, but um, getting them out will be another matter. And thank you for your attention and support so far. <laughs>